All right. It is, it's eight o'clock. Can we believe it? Back for another day. Awesome. Today is all about anatomy. All day, the whole day, anatomy. Um, we have some activities. I have some lectures. I have some activities. We have some things that we'll do to break up the time. Um, but I wanted to show you what resources you have currently online. So uh, first hour today, we're going to go through cardiology or cardiovascular anatomy and talk about vasculature that's important for you to know. Um, then next hour, we'll do neurologic anatomy, talking about the brain and structures of the skull. Um, then we'll go into GI, and then the last, we'll do some upper extremity and lower extremity high yields. Um, we will not get through every single PowerPoint slide that you have uploaded, nor do we want to. Um, so we'll go through certain PowerPoints kind of in the topics that I listed, and I'll highlight important high yield things on those slides as we go through. Some slides we'll skip, some slides we'll focus more time on. Um, so hopefully you can help, it'll help focus your study. If you're a kinesthetic learner like me, I do have anatomy labeling activities. There's tons of them up here online. They're under this section, anatomy labeling activities. You won't get pictures on your test, but this can be a great way to actually commit an image to memory and help you be able to bring up said image on your exam. We're gonna do four drawing activities today um, that will help you draw out certain areas of vasculature that can be tricky. Um, and one area of nerves that can be tricky as well, the brachial plexus. So we'll practice that together. Um, you can write on your exam. So if there is an area that you're really struggling to memorize or commit to memory, but you can draw it out, that could be a great thing to just throw on your exam when you get started or at some point to help you remember what those pieces are. So we will go through that today as well. Um, but like I said, these can be really helpful. Um, I'll just pull up one of them here. I had, I had a good one this morning. <clears throat> Um, there we go. This is what I was looking at. Okay, this one's going to be overwhelming, but that's fine. But this gives you an example. Good morning. <laughs> this gives you an example of what these labeling activities are. So you see, obviously, this is the blank one. You do have a word bank to choose from, and it's showing the different trunks of the abdominal aorta as well as coming off um, the actual aortic arch, these trunks, these are often tested on, and then you'll have your answer key on the next page. So that's how they all function, all the PDFs. I encourage you to work on first practicing, filling it in with the word bank. And then once you get better practicing, filling it in without a word bank, just from memory. That's how I would use these to study. Anatomy is repetition. So while I'm lecturing on anatomy today, that's not really the most functional or great way to actually learn it. It's really gonna be repetition, flashcards, um, these type of activities, practicing it out, coming up with mnemonics. So I encourage you, this is gonna be a section you're gonna to wanna to self-study at home as well um, for that repetition piece. The anatomy component tends to be the most failed component of NPLEX 1. Um, so it's something that I don't want you to just skip and think you know. Uh, they tend to test on more specific details and some of those we'll try to go through today but it's not, these are not gonna be the giveaway questions. Um, so this is, tends to be more of a challenging section. Why? I don't know. I can't tell you why they, they test more challenging on anatomy than they do on phys or path. Okay. Before we get going, any questions or things that came up from yesterday from our embryology discussion or from our exam or the intro? No? Okay. So we're going to go through um, the heart and chest wall part one and part two. We'll start with the heart chest wall part one PowerPoint, and then we'll go through about part of half of that, and then we'll get into the heart and chest wall part two. In the middle, we'll, we'll um, do a little activity. So it won't be all lecture. All right. Great. So looking at the heart, um, there's a couple structures that are not specifically cardiac or vascular specific that are important to know. The pericardium is one of them. Um, if we remember, the pericardium is the double-walled sac that surrounds the heart and the great vessels. It has a fibrous and a serous portion. Um, the fibrous portion is superficial. The serous portion is deep. The deep serous portion can be broken up again into two layers, the parietal and the visceral layer. 
Anytime you see visceral, just assume organ. So the visceral layer is lying directly on organ. The parietal layer is um, the more superficial of the deep layers. So it's actually um, on the internal surface of the fibrous pericardium. Uh, really the purpose and the function of the pericardium is protecting and anchoring the heart. It also prevents overfilling um, and it's helping decrease friction. When these questions come up about the pericardium, it tends to be about pericarditis or inflammation around the heart. Um, you'll see pericarditis come up with uh, what could cause pericarditis, um, condition states that could lead to that inflammatory um, state of the heart. Anatomically, I think the most high yield you could get would be to differentiate the layers, um, the parietal versus the visceral versus superficial. But I would say maybe one question if max on this. The blood supply and drainage of the pericardium, it's mainly from the pericardiophrenic artery. Um, that, not so important. That fact that it branches from the internal thoracic artery, that may be more important. Um, that's where they could ask questions, um, which branch or which um, mother artery does the drainage for the pericardium come from? That's where I would see this asked. Um, other contributions from the musculophrenic artery, again, low yield here. Uh, ultimately, I see more questions on the nerve supply from phrenic nerves C3 through C5, our sympathetic trunk, as well as the vagus nerve. So that's really where I'd focus on for pericardium, understand the layers, superficial, deep, and how the deep is broken up into two, recognize its role in pericarditis, and understand its nerve supply. Those would be the things I'd focus on. Otherwise, don't think about it too much. For coronary arteries, we talked about this a little bit yesterday, and we'll kind of go through a few different slides that cover coronary arteries throughout our time here. These are commonly asked about. This is high yield. So understanding the coronary arteries and their branching points. I do have a couple anatomy um, like fill-in sheets that you could practice these on, but I encourage you, this would be something to actually focus time on. Um, so we can see we have two main branches here, the left main coronary and the right coronary. We're gonna look at the branching from the aortic arch here in a moment. So I'm not gonna focus on actually what's coming off of the aorta. We're just gonna focus on what's covering the heart first. From our left main coronary artery, we can see it's gonna branch into two, the circumflex and the left anterior descending. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see the right coronary artery. Um, this is called distal right coronary artery, but you actually will see this as the posterior. Um, and we'll look at another picture here, maybe. Oh. I'll pull in another picture here on our, oh, maybe this is here. This, okay, posterior interventricular branch on this little image. Sorry, it's so tiny. I wish I could zoom in. So from our right coronary artery, you can see coming off here and then posteriorly, the right coronary artery feeds the posterior interventricular branch. Um, this posterior portion feeds both the posterior ventricles, right and left. And because it comes from the right coronary artery, it can be a great test question. They'll ask um, what supplies the posterior ventricles with blood on the heart. Um, or they might even ask the left posterior ventricle, wanting to pull you to a left um, artery decision or who feeds that artery or what is the source of that artery. They're hoping that you're going to say the left coronary. And the answer would be the right coronary if it has anything to do with the posterior interventricular branch. So don't let it pull you. Yes, the distal right coronary artery is the same as this posterior interventricular branch. So these pictures I want, this is pointing to your posterior interventricular branch. I would ignore this word verbiage here. I've never seen that asked or used. Yeah. So right coronary, posterior interventricular, interventricular branch, left coronary, circumflex, and left anterior descending. Those would be the five I would really commit to memory. Any extras, great. But if you know these five, that's going to serve you well for most of your coronary artery questions. These come up in regards to um, clots, atherosclerosis, and MIs. So those are mainly the questions that you'll see these used in. Um, your patient passed or your patient had a heart attack. Um, this was the region that was affected. What artery is associated? Or this artery had a clot in it. What was the artery that fed this one? Or where is that location on the heart? Those are the type of questions. Yes. Um, it depends on the condition. Yes, but your left pain coronary artery, you're going to see more affected because it's going to have to be working harder. 
So it's more likely to have atherosclerotic buildup in plaque. Good question. Awesome. All right, our next one is the abdominal aorta or the aortic arch branches, which we're gonna actually do a little activity to draw this in at the end of our lecture before our break. So we're gonna come back to this. I'll show you how to draw my beautiful picture here that I drew, but this one is helpful. This is commonly tested on high yield. So aortic arch major branch order, know your ABCs. So your aortic arch gives rise to the brachiocephalic trunk first, the left common carotid next, and the left subclavian artery. Um, there is often a trick question on the end plaque saying, what is the first branch of the aorta? And technically it is the coronary arteries. We can see here these little itty bitty right and left coronary arteries branch first from the aorta. So that's their source. The coronary arteries don't just like magically appear from the heart itself. They branch off the aorta first. So if you are asked that question and you have coronary arteries available, choose them. If you do not, then you're gonna be looking at the first official big branch, which will be brachiocephalic. I've seen both asked and both answers correct, but if you have the option for coronary arteries, choose that one. From here, we will go through these different branching patterns, but essentially the brachiocephalic artery or brachiocephalic trunk is just the main communicating trunk that separates then into the right subclavian and right common carotid. So you're still getting a right subclavian, a left subclavian, a right common carotid, a left common carotid. It's just the right-hand side comes from the same trunk, the brachiocephalic trunk. That's the only difference, but knowing the order will help you out. We will then go in and look at the branching patterns from these additionally towards the end today, because it's important to go probably another extra layer past these basic arteries to really understand the aortic arch. You do not need to study the ventricles, the valves, these things, because you should already know them. If you don't know the ventricles of the heart or the um, atria, if you don't know the order of blood flow, if you don't know which valves go with which side, review. But you don't need to study those because that should be in your head at this point, um, going through medical school. So I'm not gonna review that necessarily. If you're having trouble or you start confusing yourself, there are a couple mnemonics heart valve sequence, tri-pulling my aorta, the tricuspid pulmonary mitral aorta for your valves. Um, you could also do for atrioventricular valves, lab rat, the left atrium has bicuspid, right atrium has tricuspid. Um, the cardiac valves in order in circuit, try before you buy. Um, so that's first or first learner tricycle, then a bicycle, flow through the tricuspid first, then the bicuspid, whatever works for you. Any mnemonic would be fine. I draw a box and that's how I remembered mine. I think I showed that in cardiology. So it's really whatever helps you not forget the order. Even though this is simple, I still find students who are excellent in cardiology who will confuse the order and the valves on the NPLETS exam because you're thinking about the trunk, right? You're thinking about coronary circulation. So some of these easy things go by the wayside. So don't let that be you. Make sure you remember it, but don't spend too much time. Now the muscular layers of the heart. When we see these come up in question is when we talk about myocarditis or endocarditis. So when these layers get inflamed, um, but it's important to remember that the heart is muscle tissue and we have three layers, the epicardium, the myocardium and the endocardium. Epicardium is the external layer. Um, the myocardium is really the muscle layer. So myocarditis is inflammation of the cardiac muscle. And then endocarditis is, or endocardium is the thin internal layer um, more connective tissue based or the lining membrane covering also the valve. So endocarditis is the inflammation of that internal layer. With endocarditis, that's why we see more valvular involvement because endocarditis is really inflammation of the stuff that lines those valves and lines those actual chambers of the heart. So when that gets inflamed, that's why we can see issues like vegetations go in the valves, stenosis and issues with regurgitation. They won't ask you much more about the actual structure of connective tissue or histology. Those were questions yesterday. They're not gonna go in depth of saying like what type of um, fibrous tissue is present, but they will want you to understand the layers, external to internal. The fibrous skeleton of the heart is present. I've never seen this asked upon, so I'd say this would be low yield. When it talks about the borders, um, this is really just to help you be oriented right, left, and inferior. Uh, mainly when I see this come into play is if they were asking about infarction or death, I don't see this as much on MPLEX-1 as I see on MPLEX-2. So I would say also lower yield overall. 
looking at the cardiovascular silhouette, um, really the main part where this comes up is the apex of the heart. They'll often refer to the apex of the heart and expect you to know that it's down here. Um, so that would be the one important kind of yield piece for gross anatomy of the heart is make sure that you know the apex is towards the bottom, inferiorly towards the diaphragm. Um, that's the only thing I really can see students get mixed up with. I realize I'm flying through, it's because there's so much anatomy stuff. So I'm really trying to help you parse out what to focus on. Okay. All right, atria. So the right atrium gets blood from coronary sinus, IVC, and SVC, inferior and superior vena cava. So knowing that the right atrium receives blood from all three is important. We often forget the coronary sinus. Um, so this is really looking at kind of the structure cut away. The coronary sinus, I would say, it's the only thing I'd focus on because you know the IVC and SVC. It's going to lie in your coronary groove. It gets blood from all of your cardiac veins. Um, it is also the embryonic venous sinus. So the coronary sinus embryonically is the venous sinus, which is easy to remember. It drains venous blood and it's draining blood from where? The heart, the coronary artery, the heart itself, the heart muscle itself. That's where it's draining blood versus your IVC and your SVC is giving you venous return from where? The body, external circulation. Yes, perfect. Coronary sinus. Yep, so all the coronary arteries, all of those drain into the coronary sinus, which drains into your right atrium. So the blood supply to the heart, um, the venous supply return is through the coronary sinus versus from the circulation, um, systemic circulation would be your IVC or your SVC, depending on if it's above the heart or below. Excellent. The only other piece that I would say is important is to understand foramen ovale or foramen ovalis. Um, so if we look at our right atrium here, we can see the oval fossa here. This is the opening of the coronary sinus, just for kind of perspective, your SVC and then your IVC. So this oval fossa, um, this is essentially where it's open for drainage or communication between the right and left atria in a developing embryo or developing fetus. Um, so what we would call this the interarterial septum. It's the opening between. The fossa ovalis is what remains once it closed in a child, an infant, or an adult. So that's the two differences here. Um, this one is commonly asked about either asking you to name it or asking you to understand what it's communicating between the two atria. So that's really where I see the questions most commonly um, for these, for the this right atria question. I think those are the main important pieces here. All the septums are just separation between these different chambers. So interatrial septum is between the two atria. Um, it does have the fossa ovalis. So that would be the important anatomical structure associated with the interarterial septum. And um, there's also an interventricular septum that's located between right and left ventricles. Um, the upper portion is more membranous, the low, so fibrous. The lower portion is more muscular because it's doing more work. Moving down into the ventricle, the ventricles are the discharge chambers of the heart. The interesting anatomical structures here are our papillary muscles and trabeculae carne. Um, we can see here our papillary muscles. These little doodads are our papillary muscles connected to our tendinous cords or chordae tendinae. Um, they are helping to maintain closure of our flappy valves, our mitral and our bicuspid. They are not closing them. They're helping to keep them closed and hold them in place to help prevent backflow. Um, so that is, that could be a question you would see. Um, they might try to pull you into saying that those muscles are contracting or closing the valves. The valves are closing from the pressure itself from the heart. The pressure changes. We will look at that a little bit when we do cardiophysiology. We'll do an hour on that next week. Um, the only other component that I would say would be important is the right atria and the right ventricle do contain components of the conduction system. We will look a little bit more at that when we get into physiology. So we will talk about the conduction system and the where it's located when we talk about how it works. And that makes a little bit more sense to focus on there. Here's our beautiful papillary muscles and our chordae tendinae and the cusps. Um, the, again, the goal is to maintain closure of the valves to prevent backflow or prevent regurgitation. 
Interventricular septum, I, met, I mentioned this already. I think really the only high yield portion here is knowing that it, it's between the ventricles and the top portion is more membranous and the bottom portion is more muscular. Our left atrium is the majority of the base of the heart. So that could be an anatomical question is what chamber is located at the base of the heart? Left atrium would be your best answer. Um, otherwise, just knowing where it communicates with would be your next best high yield. Left ventricle, we're pumping blood into the aorta. It's going to have the thickest myocardium. So the thickest muscle layer because it has to do the most work. So that could be a question you would see. Uh, otherwise, outside of knowing the valves associated, those are the main questions I see regarding the left ventricle. Okay, right. so team, how are we doing so far? Good, good, awesome. Hopefully this is all review. Um, so atrial supply of the heart. So we talked about this already a little bit, but I, we're gonna go a little deeper into where it, these things are communicating. So coronary arteries are located just below the epicardium because they're really giving blood supply to the muscle layer, the myocardium. Um, they typically have fatty kind of things around them, fatty embedded, keeping them holding onto the heart. So if you look at the heart externally, you'll see little fat areas surrounding your arteries that's completely normal. Um, the endocardium gets oxygen and nutrients directly from the chambers. So if the question was asked, um, what layers of the heart are um, provided with blood from the coronary arteries, it'd be your epicardium and your um, myocardium. The endocardium, the lining of the actual valves, the lining of the actual ventricles, gets oxygen and nutrients from the blood that's within the chambers themselves for the majority. It gets a little bit from the um, arterial supply, the coronary arteries. But I've seen that question come up before. The right coronary artery, the RCA, runs in your coronary groove and gives a sinoatrial SA nodal branch near the origin. So we can see this here. This coronary artery is going to come off the aorta and right off the top, the first branch is going to be your sinoatrial nodal branch, your SA node branch, and that is going to give blood supply to the SA node. That's its purpose. You'll then see that there'll be a right marginal branch that will run off of it. Um, we can see this right marginal branch running here. Um, it will descend down towards the apex, but it won't quite reach the apex of the heart. And then we'll see the posterior portion um, moving backwards, and that gives us our posterior interventricular branch. Um, it's going to give both ventricles supply, um, and it's going to supply the majority of the posterior aspect of the heart. So if you had a posterior infarct, you're looking at the posterior interventric interventricular branch as maybe your culprit. Those would be your important parts of the RCA. The LCA, the left coronary artery, is going to come from your left aortic sinus, your, left, your actual aorta. It's going to pass between the left auricle and left side of the pulmonary trunk in the coronary groove. At the end of the groove, so right here, we're going to see it has two branches up top a lot sooner. You're going to have the circumflex branch and the anterior or left anterior descending. So we'll see the left anterior descending coming here and then the circumflex branch coming here, moving a little bit more lateral and posterior. Um, in some people, the SA nodal branch will come from the circumflex branch. And you can see some anatomical variation in people. Uh, when we're studying for the MPLEX, we're really talking about what's the majority of normal. So I would say for the MPLEX purposes, your SA branch is coming off your RCA. Okay. Just know in real life, it can vary. Yes. You could, you could have both in some people as well. For MPLEX, I don't see oftentimes like the congenital vascular changes that are physiologic asked about. If it caused a defect, that could be asked about. Yeah, absolutely. You'll see the left anterior descending is gonna travel in your interventricular groove um, all the way to the apex where it's gonna kind of move past the inferior border and it's going to actually anastomosis, so communicate with the posterior interventricular branch of the RCA. So in the back, they will meet together via small capillary anastomoses. So if the question was, what artery reaches the apex, your left anterior descending would be your best answer. Okay. Your circumflex branch is going to move um, in the coronary groove posteriorly. It's gonna give off the left marginal artery, which is the primary um, supply or one of the primary supplies of the left ventricle and it'll terminate, terminate um, before reaching uh, 
sorry, let me move this. This is not helpful. Sorry, online folks. There we go. Before reaching the cruise. So you'll see, where's my left marginal? Left marginal artery going down here. And it's going to move posteriorly, but it's not going to quite anastomosis with anything else. Okay. So LCA, high yields, no circumflex branch, no left anterior descending. Know that left anterior descending is going to reach the apex. It's going to circle around the back. It's going to communicate with your um, posterior intraventricular branch from the RCA. Your circumflex branch is kind of moving more lateral and um, going to wrap around inferiorly and going to give off the left marginal artery, which provides blood supply to the left ventricle. Those would be your most high yield for the heart. All right, venous drainage. Again, understanding that the um, everything is gonna drain into your right atrium, that would be pretty high yield. I often don't see a lot of venous or lymphatic heart drainage questions on the NPLEX exam, but there are kind of a, a couple pieces that would be important besides knowing the coronary sinus. Um, there are, let's see here, there's the great, the middle, and the small cardiac veins that drain. We can see here the great cardiac vein that's draining here. I would say if you had to know any of them, maybe know the great coronary, the great cardiac veins, so that's the big one that's going to drain the most into the coronary sinus. Everything's going to kind of communicate and move towards that great cardiac vein. Um, the middle and the small cardiac vein are obviously smaller. Um, a lot of your arteries are going to have a venous component. So you have a left marginal vein. Um, you'll have, let's see here. You have like an oblique vein. A lot of the small arteries, I even believe there is a marginal artery and a circumflex vein. So you'll have a lot of these that will have its venous component. Don't commit those to memory. Know that you're going to have small, medium, large. The great cardiac vein is the big one where everything drains into, and then it drains into the coronary sinus, which is going into the right atrium. All right, that's coronary artery circulation. Ooh, we did it. A couple other interesting things in this anterior section that are not cardiovascular is our thymus, an immunologic organ. So this would be in an immune system question. Um, it's going to lie posterior to your manubrium. Um, it's going to extend into the anterior portion of the mediastinum um, from the superior mediastinum. It's going to eventually, over time, pretty much devolve or go away or get smaller and be replaced by fat after puberty because the thymus is the place where we mature our T cells in the body. And as we get older, we have less T cells that we need to mature and differentiate. So this organ becomes less and less active and starts to pretty much become just fatty tissue once you move into that puberty stage. Um, the blood supply here is your anterior intercostal and anterior mediastinal branches of your internal thoracic arteries. So the important piece to know would be the internal thoracic is what's going to supply the blood to the thymus. The veins of the thymus end in the left brachiocephalic, internal thoracic, and inferior thyroid veins. Your lymphatic vessels, um, again, parasternal, brachiocephalic, and tracheobronchial lymph nodes. I would say don't memorize these things, just understand where it's located. And then if the structures make sense around it, then that would probably be a reasonable venous or lymphatic drainage pathway. So the one high yield thing I would understand, or I guess the two, three about the thymus, T-cell maturation goes away by puberty, puberty and is replaced with fat and is supplied by the internal thoracic. All right. The posterior mediastinum, there are a lot of different structures that are located in it. If you're trying to remember what is there, you could remember um, dates in Vegas, or uh, it's, this is a Chamberlain acronym. I don't know if any of you are mnemonic. I don't know if any of you had Dr. Chamberlain before. Yes, yeah, this is a Chamberlain mnemonic. Um, the descending aorta, the azygous and hemiazygous, uh, the thoracic duct, esophagus, sympathetic trunks, flangic nerves, intercostal arteries, and vagus nerve. How important do I think it is to remember what's located there? I don't think it's super important to know the, know the order or kind of how it's being presented, as long as you understand that all these structures are present in this mediastinal region. Um, when I see these questions asked, I don't see them asked of like, like, what's the order anterior to posterior? I see them asked more in relationship to what are the sympathetic trunks or splanchic nerves innervating, right? Or what are these um, veins or arteries communicating with or draining? 
So I wouldn't necessarily worry about the order from top to bottom. All right, your thoracic aorta. So this is gonna get into our, I believe maybe it will get into kind of our drawing activity here soon. Your thoracic aorta begins on the left border of the body of T4. And Plex loves asking you where things start and end in relationship to the vertebra, even though it varies depending on person to person. So I would say, where is the where is the thoracic aorta originate in regards to the spine? T4 would be your best bet for an answer there. Um, it's going to descend descend through T5 and T12. The thoracic aortic plexus is the autonomic nerve network that surrounds the thoracic aorta section. At the uh, T12 point, that's when you would call the thoracic aorta the abdominal aorta. And so I often see that one tested on as well, is when does the abdominal aorta originate at T12. The thoracic duct and azygous veins descend on the right side of the thoracic aorta, and they'll move it through the hiatus, um, through kind of this portion here, the diaphragm, downward. We're gonna look at the branching of the abdominal aorta when we get to the gut. So we will go through all the branches of the abdominal aorta. And at the end of this lecture, in about 10 minutes, we're gonna do the aortic arch and look at the branches. The thoracic duct and the lymphatic trunks, if I would know one lymphatic structure, it'd be the thoracic duct. Um, it originates from your uh, left cisterna chile or the chile cistern in the abdomen, and it's gonna ascend through your aortic hiatus that we saw here, I believe, um, we can't see in this picture, your aortic hiatus right here. It's just a little structure that the aorta is gonna go through. Oh, hello online. Um, it's gonna carry the majority of the lymph of the body, all about everything that's in your nine to 12 o'clock portion. So almost everything is draining into this thoracic duct, which is why it's the one important duct to know. Uh, it's going to be right around your inferior, the bodies of the inferior seven vertebra. So you can kind of see it lying here. Um, at the level of about T4 through T6, the duct will cross onto the left side, posterior to your esophagus, and it's going to ascend up into your superior mediastinum. There's branches from the middle and upper intercostal spaces that it's going to receive lymphatic drainage from, and it empties at your left venous angle. So really understand that the majority of stuff drains into the thoracic duct. So if there's a problem with drainage, that's a good structure to guess, unless if it's in this nine to 12 o'clock range, that's going to have a different drainage pathway, which we will look at when we look at the lymphatic system. Yes, sorry. So you will see here, let me go back. This is your esophageal hiatus here. This is where your esophagus is traveling down. This is your aortic hiatus here, where your aortic is aorta. There are two different holes. Yes. So you would want to know two different areas. Could they travel, traverse through the same region? Sure, but that would be an anatomic abnormality. Excellent, excellent, excellent. Good, good. And you can see this here. This would be your esophageal hiatus because we've cut away the esophagus versus your aortic hiatus here. We've also cut away the aorta. Okay. So vessels and lymph nodes of your posterior mediastinum. Um, let's see what we can find here that's important for you all. The azygous system, I guess, would be the most important venous structure that I would try to remember. Um, the azygous system of veins is on both sides of the vertebral column. It's gonna drain the back. Um, the thoracoabdominal walls and the mediastinum viscera. Uh, the azygous vein and the hemozygous vein arise from roots uh, that are arising in the posterior aspect of the IVC, inferior vena cava, or even the renal vein, um, respectively. So azygous IVC and renal vein for hemozygous. Um, they'll merge together um, and they'll drain into the severe, superior vena cava. Um, it allows essentially the azygous vein a collateral pathway of venous return between the SVC and the thorax. So it allows for different um, pathways or passage of blood to drain through that isn't just the main kind of big two venous ducts, the IVC and the SVC. So it's a collateral pathway. I would not, not, not commit every vein to memory. I would know the big one. 
if you love anatomy or you're an anatomist or you're a, that's your background sure go for it i would not do it for this exam otherwise the azygous system also communicates with the vertebral venous plexus um, it's going to drain the black vertebra and the structures that are in the vertebral canal um, so this could be asked if there was an issue with blood in the vertebral canal, if there was some blockage, if there was potentially an infection, they could ask where it's going to drain through or what would be the collecting ducts for um, that blood in the venous or the vertebral canal. Azygous system would be your answer. So when in doubt, azygous and hemizygous are a pretty good answer for most of your venous drainage. Okay. The only thing I'll say here about the nerves are the thoracic um, sympathetic trunk lies really close to the spinal column. Um, we know that our sympathetic nervous system, the uh, preganglionic and postganglionic nerves, they'll synapse really close to that spinal cord, just right outside, right next to the vertebra. Um, so when that synapse occurs, you will see that you're going to have these branches coming off of the spinal column um, directly, and those are going to be your preganglionic. You'll have your ganglia and then your postganglionic. And so that would really be your sympathetic trunk. Um, I wouldn't necessarily learn like each single individual trunk space because we know that you can have um, synapses that come initially out of your spinal cord at the level of T3 that maybe will synapse all the way down at T6. That can happen. You can move up and down that sympathetic trunk. Um, so really just knowing that it's close to the spinal cord, that would be the most important piece here. All right. Formation of the heart, we're not going to go into because we did, I kind of talked about that yesterday, but if you wanted an additional review, these are just three slides on it. This is your part two of the chest. This really gets more into bony structures um, and maybe is, and some muscular structures of the thorax and the um, thoracic region. Uh, there's not going to be a lot of things that I talk about here. I will spend a little time with ribs because there are a few ribs that they like to ask about. The first rib, because it looks so different, it's the widest, it's the shortest, it's the most curved, and it has several grooves for the subclavian veins and arteries. So that would be the most important high yield thing would be if you had a fracture in your first rib, um, what vasculature could be affected? And it'd be your subclavian artery and vein. Um, they have a scalene tubercle that separates both of them. I Again, when it comes to bony structures, if there's not an attachment point by a muscle or um, if it's not a commonly injured area, I wouldn't necessarily focus on specific bony landmarks unless if they're already in your memory. There's too many in the body. Um, when it comes to your second rib, there are two fats. It's on its head. It's going to articulate with the bodies of T1 and T2 vertebra. And then your 10 through 12 ribs only have one facet communicating with the ones below. 11 and 12 are going to be short, no neck, no tubercle, and they are not full ribs, right? They're going to be floating ribs. The thoracic vertebra, um, the interesting portion here is it has to have its communication spaces with the ribs. So you're going to have these facets um, to have articulation points with the tubercle of the rib. Um, the spinous process is going to be more pointed. That's why you can palpate it. I think that's the main component that you'll see when it comes to the thoracic spine. Cervical is much more interesting. Here's the whole picture if you want to see it here. Your two floating ribs here. Um, you can see intercostal spaces, funky first rib up top. Those would be mainly your high yields. Yeah, I wouldn't go too much on it. Clearly, I was feeling fun when I was adding these things. Okay. These um, sometimes are asked about, again, when we have the option to provide you with what MPLEX might ask you. Um, so the top portion up here of your manubrium, T2, the communication between that and your sternum, T4, and the end, T9. How accurate is that? Depends on someone's anatomy, but these would be the best ones to commit to memory. I saw a hand. Yes, so the having its own cartilage and connecting all the way back to the actual sternum itself. So the true ribs, we can see all these true ribs here would be correct. These would be true ribs. And then we start to see false ribs as they don't actually connect all the way back to the sternum themselves. They do have cartilage, but these, these ribs at the end portion are not true ribs, they're floating. So you have two floating, you have 
three false ribs, and then you have the rest, which would be true ribs. Yeah. Versus a false rib. And you will see that vary depending on the test writer, the test question. So what I would say the two T11, T12 are false ribs. So in that they are inherently not true ribs. So that's why I'd state there. T1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 are true ribs. T8 through 10, they could be called false ribs or true ribs depending on your source because they do connect back to the sternum, but they don't themselves have a direct communication point to the sternum themselves. They're connecting to the cartilage of rib T7, or T8. It's my best answer I can give you because I've seen both on NFLEX. So I would say if I was writing NFLEX, based off of Marib and Gutten and Hall, our physiology textbooks, the true ribs are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Ribs eight through 10 are false and 11 and 12 are floating. Yeah. Typical rib, you could, you could put true, yes. So I would say typical true, you could probably use interchangeably false ribs, I would say are their own special category and floating with only T11 and 12. That's what I would use. Again, though, depending on your question writer, that's where you can see the variety in the verbiage and then probably how late long ago they learned anatomy. Yeah. All right. So the sternum, we have our manubrium up top with our jugular notch located here. We have our sternal angle and then the xiphoid process at the bottom. These would be the most important structures just to know. So manubrium, sternum, xiphoid process. I would not unnecessarily care about the costal notches. If there's a question about that, that's just mean. Um, the, let's see here, if there's anything important. I guess the only real important piece would be that the jugular notch would be at T2 and that um, sternal angle T4 and xiphoid process T9. That's really what I would put to memory for these components. So some more vertebral angles of thoracic landmarks. So our jugular notch, we already talked about at T2, sternal angle at T4, heart, we can kind of see between T5 through T8, the heart, maybe T9, depending on who you ask. Your um, xiphoid process, T9 to 10, diaphragm, that would be inappropriate, and then the aorta. Um, when it becomes the abdominal aorta is T12. So those would be kind of your, your best approximations for thoracic spine landmarks. When we look at the gut, we'll talk about the kidney. Correct. It passes through the diaphragm and then at T12, and then that is where we call it the abdominal aorta. Yeah. We can see here, Kind of the structures. If we look, um, this is posterior vertebra. Um, we can see esophagus, trachea, and then our bony structures and our arteries and veins in front. So moving from anterior to posterior, bone, vein, artery, trachea, esophagus, vertebra. Yeah. Never. Yeah, that's a good question. Let me see if I have, I'll pop out here in a second. We'll go back up, but essentially it's when it's going, when it's moving upward, we call it ascending. When it's at its top, we call it the arch. And then when it's going down, we call it descending. And then the posterior portion, when it's going down, we call that the thoracic aorta. That's the best answer I have for you. But where it's branching, that's the arch of the aorta outside of the coronary arteries, which would be a part of the ascending. Yeah, excellent, good question. Some joints of the thoracic cage. We have our costovertebral joints of the head of the ribs. Um, we can see those. We have our costotransverse joints, which are the tubercle of the rib articulating with our transverse process, which you can't really see great picture here. Um, and your costochondral, which is the lateral end of the costal cartilage with the sternal end of the rib, and then the sternal costal, the medial end with the sternum. How often are you gonna be asked about these joints? Probably not often. Um, I would really only just know them for your anatomical markings, but really uh, understanding true rib, false rib, 
um, floating rib. Those would be probably your most common rib question. We'll talk a little bit about breathing and we will talk a little bit about breast tissue. Let me see how long I have. It's, we're gonna talk about breast tissue when we talk about reproduction. Okay, I think this is a perfect time. All right. So what I want us to do is, online folks, tell me if you can see this once we get it going. Takes a minute for it to load. So as we're doing this, I encourage you to get a piece of paper. I do have some additional paper up here if you want some funky green paper. I also do have a sign-in sheet on the first break. I'll have people sign in. But if you want some paper, go ahead and take some. I'm opening up the doc cam, which typically works if I turn it on. We'll see. There we go. And we're gonna practice drawing our aortic arch. Awesome, all right. So we're gonna draw the aortic arch, the three major branches, and then their sub branches. We're essentially gonna work our way up from the arch to the neck. Oh, do you see, you see the doc cam now? Okay, great, thank you. Awesome, all right. So with our drawing for aortic arch, and I remind you, I am no, I am no artist, okay? So this is gonna be the best thing, the best thing we're gonna do. But you're gonna start essentially with your um, picture, you're gonna make a candy cane. You're making a candy cane. That's the first thing you're gonna draw, okay? With your candy cane at the beginning, right off the bat, you're gonna put two lines off of it. And these two lines are going to be your right and your left coronary. So it's gonna be the, your right coronary, okay, for your candy cane. You're then gonna have see it on trunks, okay? And I'm gonna try to draw them as part as far as I can so that we have room to write. You're gonna have, technically they're all coming off of this arch portion up here. Um, so I'll move down a little bit. But I'm going to draw mine a little bit more lateral just so we have space. So you're going to have one. There's no perfectionism here. <laughs> Two. We, 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 hello? We can't see it online. <laughs> We're not selling them. I promise. It's okay. Two, three. Okay, so these are going to be our three trunks. This first or this last trunk over here is going to be our left subclavian. Dr. Pet Show. Hello? The middle trunk is going to be our left I guess you can't common carotid. And then the first trunk we drew is going to be our radiocephalic. We have our three trunks now that you can see. Okay. Our branch points, we're gonna start all the way over from on our left subclavian, because this is gonna be a little bit easier. It's going to branch into two here, okay? The bottom branch is going to be your left axillary, A-X-I-L-L-A-R-Y. Your top is going to be your left vertebral. And then your left vertebral is going to eventually, and we'll see this when we get up to the circle of Willis, will be moving and your brain will move into your basilar. So this is a continuation of the same. That's all that we have to know about our left subclavian, okay? 
we're going to do our brachiocephalic next because this one is a little bit more intensive. The left common carotid is easy. So our brachiocephalic, we're going to have two main branch points initially, and then this is going to branch again into two. And then this is going to branch again into two. It almost looks like two like antenna coming off. Okay. These two branch points are going to be your right subclavian and your right common carotid. So now we have a right subclavian, a left subclavian, a right common carotid, and a left common carotid. Okay. So now we look equal. So we can guess then what are these two branches going to be? If we had to guess. Axillary and vertebral, exactly. So now we have our right axillary and our right vertebral, which will become what? The basilar, hmm? just like on the left. So if you can get your brachiocephalic and remember it's gonna break down into the right subclavian and the right common carotid, which is literally just mirroring the left side, you're good. You only have to memorize one side and you'll have it all. So literally you could memorize your brachiocephalic trunk and you'll know all the arches of the aorta. The two that are gonna, are gonna branch from the right common carotid and the left common carotid are going to be your external and your internal carotids, right? So you're gonna have your external here, external carotid, this will be right, and then your internal carotid. Right, and then you're gonna have your left internal, I think there's some extra words there, the letters, carotid, and your left external carotid. That's all you need to know for your arch of the aorta. So what I encourage you to learn is the brachiocephalic trunk. If you can remember the brachiocephalic trunk branches first, it's gonna branch into right and left, uh, or, right common, or right subclavian, right common carotid. The right subclavian goes into right axillary and right vertebral. And then the right common carotid goes into internal and external carotid. Then you can literally fill in the blank with your left common carotid. It's gonna match or mirror the right common carotid. And the left subclavian is gonna mirror the right subclavian. It's only one thing you have to memorize. And you'll know all of the branching points of your other, starting with your candy cane. Okay, any questions on that one? I love me a good drawing, drawing time. Therapeutic. All right, let's see here. We're gonna take a break. Um, oh, perfect. Okay, don't see it. Okay, sorry, thanks. We're gonna take a break. We'll come back at nine, so seven minute break. And then we're gonna move into the gut. So we're gonna move into the abdo abdomen and then we will talk about abdominal aorta. For those of you online, um, if you couldn't see it, I will try to post a picture online. I will take a picture and upload it to Moodle so you can at least see my drawing. Um, I'm not sure given that you are sharing my screen if you're able to see the dot cam, I'm sure I can make it happen. So I'll try that next time, sorry about that. 